Hello and welcome to our Going Green Matters webinar series called Grow Your Own Food. We're so happy that you could join us tonight. Um, growing your own food has become more popular in the last year and we're happy to share um, a wonderful presentation by the organic gardener. Um, uh, so our expert is, um, is, <clears throat> is Adrian Detanico. And she started, she, she joined the Organic Gardener in 2014 as the lead garden educator and is now the vice president. She has helped expand our in-house propagation program. Um, and she's been instrumental in running the large production focused gardens at corporate campuses, country clubs, and home gardens. Um, and, The, the Organic Gardener is um, based in Northbrook and they construct unique interactive outdoor spaces tailored to meet each client's needs. They also work with city families to create gardens in urban spaces like rooftops, decks, and patios. And their projects range from suburban country clubs to lead certified apartment buildings to community gardens and underserved food deserts. Um, this is the book that the founder and president Jeannie Nolan has written. It's called From the Ground Up. It is a wonderful story. Um, and we and so we're going to go ahead and um, introduce Adrian. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello. Thank you so much for that introduction, Amy. Thank you so much for everybody being here today. It's, um, it's actually quite nice to be cozy in our homes and we can talk about gardening. Um, so thank you to Zoom <laughs> and for everybody who organized this. Um, yeah, very exciting that we've got a lot of Wilmette residents and um, we have a lot of intermediate gardeners. I think that no matter what, one thing that I've learned in my years of gardening, and I've gardened now for about 10 years, is that we can always learn more. It's never perfected. Uh, it's always a learning curve and uh, new things are brought to us every year. So with that, I do wanna go over some basics. Um, I'm gonna go into depth on some of these topics and then hopefully we'll have some time for uh, Q&A, which will be moderated um, by Amy. And um, I also have lots of pictures to show. So let's get started. There we go. <laughs> okay, so I think the first thing I like to ask people is, um, why do you want to grow food? Um, I think for a lot of us, there's so many different reasons. You know, one is certainly we want to get more in touch with our food. We've learned so much about how disconnected we've become from our food, um, how you know a cucumber in the grocery store gets there, and that whole journey to actually have that journey in your own home is very important. I think. Certainly over the last couple of years, we've realized how important it is to try and be more self-sufficient um, and be more resilient in our current systems. Um, there's also, you know, we wanna reduce our, our packaging. We wanna reduce our food miles. And I think those are all really important things. But I really do think that at the heart of it all, and I'm, I'm hoping everybody here will somewhat agree, is that we really wanna create connections. And it's not just the connections in our gardens with our pollinators and our birds and our plants, but it's connections with other gardeners. Uh, it's connection with our food, with other people who pr um, produce food and create food. I know that I have a lot of flowers now in my front yard and I can't tell you how wonderful it was in the last year to watch people walking because so many people have taken on walking, which is so wonderful. And they stop to look at the flowers and the little kids will, very politely ask if they can pick some flowers. And it's really a moment where I never thought I'd be this close to my neighbors. Uh, we were always also busy at work and not you know, out there. So for me, it's about the connection. And I think that's what a lot of us here are trying to attain is that connection to something that, I mean, we used to all know how to grow our own food or most of us did and that art has been lost. So with that, let's jump right in. Okay. So this is gonna seem very basic, but I think it's good to touch on some basics 
so that we can make sure we're all starting from the same place, but then also realize that some of these things are not as basic as we think they are. Um, the first thing we're gonna talk about today is sun. We're gonna talk about soil. We're gonna talk about water. And obviously soil and water are issues we could spend weeks discussing. So we will try and get through those as quickly as we can. Um, we're gonna talk about pathways and accessibility in your garden spaces. And then of course, fencing and protecting your wonderfully hard fought vegetables from those critters that seem to wanna to also share in the, the hard work that you've done. So the picture you can see here is one of our gardens in Michigan. Um, we had a really wonderful strawberry harvest this year. Um, but again, we'll talk a little bit about this. We had a great strawberry harvest in Michigan. There were other places where we didn't have as good of a harvest. And then there were places where the critters got the bulk of the strawberries. I'm sure a lot of people here have experienced that. Um, but one thing that I've learned, and like I said, I've been growing food for about 10 years. I had an urban farm for four years on the west side and the south side of Chicago. Um, I've grown in so many different yards and uh, rooftop installations and corporations and schools. But what I've really noticed is that I could learn all I want to learn. I can take all the classes I want to take. I can, I have a, a certificate in sustainable urban agriculture, but at the end of the day, I really needed the curiosity to get out there and experiment. And I needed to be able to have some of my bedside reading be about gardening, um, kind of nerd out on the garden. And I'm sure that those of you who are willing to spend your evening with us tonight are in that same boat, but um, there's always really great things to read. Um, I also think that you need to be willing to make mistakes. I have learned more with gardening by the mistakes I've made than the things I thought I got right or read in a book and it worked out just fine. Um, my first garden experiment, my new house, this was in 2008, I thought it'd be so fun to plant um, lemon balm and I put it right in the ground and I have lemon balm forever and ever now. That was a mistake that I won't make in anybody else's garden and I probably won't make in my next garden. Um, I love the lemon balm, but as those of you who are growers know, those mints like to travel. Um, but I really do think that it has to come from a place of love. I think that's something that we've certainly learned in the last year. Um, things that come from the heart are so much more powerful. And for me, a garden failure, I still give that plant love and I thank it for what it's done um, in helping my soil structure and giving me something to look at um, and giving maybe a bird a seed to eat. So for me, those three things, curiosity and the willingness to make mistakes and to come things with at things with love are very important. But at the end of the day, I have to admit, <laughs> I have done a lot of my learning because of Google. <laughs> um, a search engine at the ready is a very important. I oftentimes will be in the field and I manage a group of about 15 gardeners and sometimes they've got questions at me. I'm, I'm their horticultural lead and I don't always know the answer. There's a lot of knowledge out there. Um, I learned some gardening skills from a 98 year old gardener and she still hadn't figured it all out and she had been gardening for 50 years so there's answers out there there are people who want to help and i think it's all about making those connections and talking things through or reading that subreddit on how to grow tomatoes <laughs> um okay very basic i know but i think it's worth mentioning because i'm sure some people on this zoom today have had this problem where they think they've got a great spot but somehow their vegetables don't thrive. They're not as tasty as they thought they would be. Um, one thing that we've noticed in the, the North Shore area, we've got these beautiful trees. It's one of the things that makes the North Shore so beautiful, but they cast a lot of shadows. Um, we also have a lot of buildings. Um, what we have found is that over the years, if you don't have eight to 10 hours of sunlight, you're not gonna have necessarily the best vegetables the tastiest vegetables. They might be more susceptible to pest and disease pressure. Some places only get six to eight hours of sunlight. Maybe you wanna put it in your backyard, but that only gets five hours of sunlight. Front yard, can you do that in your community? Um, but the best possible sun will make up for any other deficiencies um, other than maybe a bunny taking all of your tomatoes. Um, so it's something to look at and it's something to, you know, you may have had a great garden five years ago and maybe the last couple of years you're like, why is this not working? Take a look at the sun. 
Did a tree grow a branch right over your garden? Did a neighbor put up arborvitae that now have sort of shaded over your garden? Um, these are things that we don't realize they change because we see them happening so gradually. Um, but this is honestly one of the biggest impediments that I have seen. Um, that doesn't mean you can't grow if you don't have eight to 10 hours. You just have to be aware of the challenge that you might be having ahead of you. Um, so how do you figure out how much sun you actually have? Obviously, you know, the first thing you're gonna have to do is make some observations. Um, the last few days I've been watching the sun as it's melting all this snow and I'm actually seeing where those icicles have formed and it's helped me figure out where are the spots I'm actually getting some more sun than I thought. Um, so, you know, spending a day at home, maybe you're working from home, um, taking a look every hour at the place you wanna have a garden or the place where you've had your garden in the past and see what kind of sunlight it's getting. Now it's gonna vary obviously over the course of the year because of um, the way the sun moves around the sky. So, you know, but this, looking at it now will still give you an idea and we are going closer and closer to the spring equinox and lo and behold, we will have a lot more sunlight at our disposal. So worth taking a look. The other thing I have done is it's a very simple thing to do, which is to pull up your address on Google Maps. Um, it's actually quite fun to look at your satellite view. Um, and you can actually sometimes figure out, at least for me, on the garden, what year Google is using as their picture <laughs> for their satellite, because I can see what things I've had growing. Now, you might have to get a magnifying glass, look pretty closely. But, you know, these maps are oriented with north. Um, and so you can figure out where the, obviously the sun is going to come in the east and you can look to see in this picture here, I, you've got trees that are on that, um, that side of the garden there that's going to cast a shadow as the sun moves away across the, the south um, hemisphere there. So you can see where you might have impediments. It's just a tool. Um, uh, like I said, I just like to sometimes look and see what things have done well based on the, the satellite view. So take a look at that. Um, you know, it's a much bigger view than maybe if you have a lot of containers, but you can still see where the shadows are hitting, um, at least vaguely. You're not going to know exactly between, you know, eight o'clock and nine o'clock where it was the exact point of the sun, but there are ways to do that. There are apps out there. They all cost money, and I have found them fairly difficult to use. So there's nothing better than observation, maybe taking a look at your Google Maps, and then just growing and seeing how, you know, you. I've had this, I had a garden I've been doing for 10 years, and um, I noticed the places I put tomatoes, I put them on two opposite sides of the garden. And this year, it was very stark. One side, the tomatoes were beautiful, tall. The other side, very shrimpy, um, looking kind of anemic. And we did the same soil preparation. We did everything the same. And then I looked up and honestly, the trees had grown so much over the last few years, but we hadn't noticed it. Um, so observation, really important. Okay, so sun. There's not much you can do about sun. You have the sun that you have. Um, maybe you can do some tree trimming, but I don't necessarily want to do more tree trimming than I need to, um, especially nothing that would be good for the tree. We need those trees to be part of our ecosystem and for all of our um, critters that live in our, our built environment. Um, but there are things that you do have control over, and that's where we're going next. Soil. There are some great podcasts now all about soil. People are talking about soil in a way that five years ago, I never thought they would talk about it. Um, soil has a real uh, potential to, to even answer some of our climate change um, challenges um, by sequestering CO2. And we're just starting to learn these things and understand how important they are. Does your garden have something, so a role to play in that? And absolutely, if we think of all of the gardens out there that maybe there's bare soil or we're doing rototilling every year and we'll talk more about ways in which to preserve your soil. You do have control over this. It just takes, again, some patience and love and some time. Um, but I just, here's the first thing I'm sure those intermediate gardeners and the advanced gardeners out there know, and I hope the beginning gardeners know, soil is not dirt. <laughs> it is soil, it is a underground living ecosystem. And it is one of the most important things that we have to work with when we're growing food. 
So ideally, if we had, could talk about a natural state, it would be 50% minerals that come from weathered rocks. So that's literally like water going on rocks and taking those minerals out. And organic matter that comes from microorganisms. So that's bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes. And it's everything as part of their life process from their birth to their death to everything in between. And then the other 50% would be air and water. Well, that's great. There's not necessarily always um, an ideal anywhere, right? This doesn't necessarily exist. And I think where we live, especially the communities that were noted on the poll, you know, we're living in a very built environment. That means that this, the area around your house had a fair amount of construction. There was a fair amount of compaction that came from the big machinery that was used to build the house, walking on it, um, or there potentially are contaminants in your soil. These are things that you know we sometimes don't wanna think about, but that has made an impact on your soil. And a lot of times that soil has been brought in because it's a fill. Um, especially in Wilmette, Evanston area, there's definitely lead paint. And I'm sure that those of you who are already gardening out there know either soil test to test for heavy metals or bring in some compost um, and make a raised bed uh, to contain it. Um, that's mostly an issue for, you know, if you're working with kids and they may be eating the soil, um, it's not as likely that things are going to be taken up by the plants themselves, but you're still, you know, interacting with those items. So important to know, um, but you're going to have to build your soil some, and that's going to take making compost, bringing in compost, um, and working with raised beds or literally and raised beds doesn't necessarily just have to mean, oh, I have timbers that I've created a bed space. It can also mean just bringing up the soil level by bringing more and more compost and leaves and mulch and that sort of thing. Um, or containers. Um, I started gardening on a balcony with lots of containers. Containers of all things, all sorts. Containers that I bought at the store, containers that I constructed on my own, five gallon buckets, uh, lettuce containers, anything I could find that I could put some um, soil in and grow something in. Um, and there's also, you know, there's the opportunity potentially for some home indoor gardening if you wanna experiment with microgreens, which is another way to um, grow your own food. But this can take some time. That doesn't mean you shouldn't immediately start gardening as soon as we can get out there and do some gardening. Um, whether or not your soil is where we want it to be and is it ideal, again, there's no such thing as an ideal in my world. Um, we're always working with an ever-changing system, um, but we can do things to foster that, right? So um, these are some guidelines. Um, so guidelines for supporting your soil. These are just some things that I have experimented with um, over the last few years that I have seen some real positive effects. So one thing is start growing. Um, people often ask me, like, how do I condition my soil? There are so many conditioners that we can buy out there. There are things that we can add to the soil. But I have found that the best thing to actually help your soil do its best is to actually start growing some roots. Um, and so that's growing anything. It could be perennials, it can be flowers, and it can be veggies. Um, but just getting things growing that really starts to foster the microbial life in soil that actually helps with the whole photosynthesis process and for making the most tasty, lovely vegetables that you can grow. The second thing that I have found incredibly important, and this can be challenging, is to mulch your garden. Bare soil will often, um, I don't know if anybody's ever noticed, you could put compost in and eventually, you know, by mid-season, the compost level has gone down, right? There's some normal compaction that happens with rain. Um, and potentially as we were working with the soil, but some of it is literally going off into the atmosphere. Um, CO2 comes out of that bare soil. Um, so for me, the most important time when I don't have things growing in the soil actively is in the end of the season over the winter to try and mulch as much as possible. I try to mulch when I'm actually growing my vegetables, but that doesn't always work exactly how I want it to. Um, so at the very least at the end of the season, straw, leaves, compost, I've used cardboard, newspaper, anything to just to cover it and tuck it in for the season. Amending every year with a little bit, a light layer of compost, whether you make it yourself or not. Um, avoiding working that soil when it's wet. 
um, pursuing conservative digging. A lot of gardeners think that we need to rototill every year. I would say avoid it unless you have a lot of roots. There's been some heavy compaction event. So maybe you had some construction um, or you're creating a new area and you really need to break some sod. Um, I also love using cover crops. Um, here, and I have a, in the previous slide, there was a picture of some hairy vetch, it's one of my favorites, but I've also experimented with just using old seeds. So I've got um, radish seeds that are, you know, maybe five or six years old and their germination rate has gone down a bit. I'm going to throw those in the soil and just let them grow. And if I can get something to eat out of them, great. Um, and then I try to stick in at the organic gardener, we definitely stick with organic granular amendments. So that's slow release things that the microbes actually in the soil are the ones that break it all down and make it available for the plant. So that slow release. <sighs> so again, we could talk a long time about soil. And then I have a couple of resources at the end of these slides that'll explain where you can maybe get some extra compost. And I know that we're gonna be having another little compost session. Um, there's lots of great ways to you know, add some organic matter to your soil. I do wanna talk about water briefly. Obviously water is necessary for life. Um, and the best thing you can do to reduce your water consumption is actually to install a drip line or a soaker hose. Um, these can be easily purchased at the hardware store or um, Dripworks it is an online place. You can get home kits um, and an auto, ooh, excuse me. or an automatic timer also when you're on vacation um, or you know you're gonna be gone away from the house for a long period of time. Um, I have rain barrels. They can be more difficult to manage, but the best thing about rain obviously is that it's free and it's chlorine free because unfortunately most of our municipal water sources are treated and that isn't necessarily the best thing for your plants. It's unavoidable um, because it can be a lot of management to get um, chlorine free water unless you're lucky enough to have a whole house filter. Um, so just be aware when you're using any sort of rain catchment system to um, it's best to use that in perennials or use it on things you're not going to immediately harvest. Just in case there's runoff from something that you don't want to eat. Trying to water at the base of the plant, not on the leaves as much as possible. I tend to do early, early morning watering unless I'm planting, then I got to get water to those seedlings as soon as I can. I try to do a long duration of watering but with less frequent watering to really force those roots to dig deep and get water from deeper into the soil. Um, I think a question that I get a lot is how much should I water? And you'll hear people give you measurements and those never really resonated for me. I really needed to spend some time with my plants, see how they're looking. Are they looking wilty? Have I felt the soil? Does the soil feel overly moist? Does it feel super dry? Like I can't even get my finger into the soil. Um, it's a tricky thing. I think most people tend to overwater, but then not having water during a particularly important time of growth can do a lot of damage to your potential yield. So you, you have to find that balance. And I think by spending time with your plants, you'll find it. Um, and just be aware on really hot days, why are your leaves wilting? It may not be because they're stressed out of water. They, they might be just protecting themselves from the heat, just like we might shrink away from the heat. Um, and really getting in there and feeling things with your fingers is really important. Fencing. This can, again, be a very expensive proposition depending on where you are, but just small, even just individual covers for some of your plants, especially during those very sensitive times when they're itty bitty. Um, in our area, obviously we're gonna have the cottontail and the whitetail deer. Um, there are other critters. I'm sure that many people out there have encountered raccoons and possums and mice and rats. Um, there's very few things you can do other than caging your entire garden, um, but just be aware of maybe other sources that are bringing in those animals. You know, maybe it's someone's not closing their um, refuse bin, someone's not picking up after a dog, um, or maybe you're, somebody's going into your compost bin. So just be aware of places where they may be coming in. But as you can see in this picture, this is a pretty simple chicken wire with um, T posts and it keeps it protected. Um, we don't have a gate on this one, but it works. But there's just, it's very disheartening, I know, to go through your 
the work that you've gone through and then have somebody eat your items. Um, but I also know that our friend the squirrel loves to take that tomato right when it's just ripe. Um, and so we get a lot of questions about this. Like, how do I keep the chipmunks and squirrels out of my garden? It's kind of like the sun. Um, there's not much you can do um, other than what we do, pick early and often as much as possible. Picking things a little under ripe is sometimes even better than waiting for it to ripen perfectly on the vine. It'll still taste way better than anything you get at the store. Some people use hot sauce and garlic. Just be aware that it will wash off in the rain. And I have made the mistake of eating things that had a garlic concentrate on it, greens, and it's just not very tasty. I love garlic, don't get me wrong, but not the garlic concentrate. Um, and row cover. Um, sometimes even you can even get these on Amazon pretty easily, or any of your garden stores have these uh, fabrics that you can cover things when they're very sensitive or you're, you're having an issue with birds, for example. I can't grow peas in my backyard because the birds take the greens. I didn't know that birds do this. They do. <laughs> they eat peas. Um, they'll eat Swiss chard. They will take greens, especially when they're nesting. I think they need the extra um, nutrients. So um, keeping them covered somehow, um, but, you know, getting in there and making sure they're you're still interacting with those plants. Um, really just quick, just reminder to make sure you have access to your plants. Um, I have made the mistake of putting things in certain places and then I can never go to them because I was very eager to get them in the ground. Um, it's good to have access to your plants. It's good for you to be able to enjoy the space a little bit more as well. So make sure you're thinking about that when you're planting. Another question that we get a lot of is how close should I plant my veggies? And so you can see in these pictures, um, when they were just emerged, these plants were just emerged or just planted and how little room they took. And then what they look like about, oh, two months later. This garden, you know, these are, this is edamame and tomatoes and it's very lush, it's looking great, but we have to think about how are we gonna get in there? Um, how are we gonna access those vegetables? So I, I think we all do this as gardeners, we get really excited and we start over planting, thinking that it doesn't look full enough. Um, but the more room you can give your vegetables, the better. Um, and pay attention to what those seed packets say about 12 inches apart, six inches apart. And I would say if you've had problems with this in the past, taking a ruler out there with you is actually really important because we all think we know, I think we all learn this, what you know a foot looks like, but in reality in the garden, you put that ruler down, you're like, really? I have to put my tomatoes this far apart, but you have to think about what is it gonna look like in two months? And is the airflow gonna be so poor that I'm gonna be inviting pest and disease pressure? Um, I'm sure many of you have heard about square foot gardening. I think this is a great way for beginners to get started. There's some really great resources online about how to measure things out, but it's literally, you make a grid system. This works great when you have a raised bed. This is a great exercise when you're working with kids too. Um, but as you can see from here, you know, 16 radishes take up as much room as one kale. And so there's this uh, formula that you're using and they have different ways of sort of counting each one of these, um, how much room they're gonna take. So I like this method to start with. Eventually you kind of grow out of it, I think, and you start to just get a feel for how much room you should be giving your items. Um, I think this helps, um, when to plant helps determine what to plant. Um, a lot of times people don't know either when to start or they're hesitant or they start too early. Um, I know around here in Chicago, we're zone 5B, depending on where you are. There's some places where we're actually flirting with zone six. Um, and then there are places where it's an, a colder zone five. It's shifting every year. I have seen a lot of changes over the last, especially the last five years in terms of what kind of climate we're having. Um, I'm leaning towards planting later and later, as painful as that sometimes can be. Um, I know, you know, you, you we kind of divide our crops into the cold tolerant crops, the heat loving crops, the fall crops, and those overwinter crops. And that's how we manage our garden year. Um, greens and peas, you know, some people say get them out on St. Patrick's Day. 
I'm, I have to wait until that soil has warmed up a little bit. Um, I don't think, depending on what happens in the next few weeks, you know, I'll be starting until April 1st. Um, I might be doing some general prep around the garden before then, but probably not seeding anything directly into the ground until April 1st. But it depends. We might have all the snow might melt and we can get out there. Um, your heat loving crops, remember, they are heat loving crops. I think one of the biggest mistakes we make is that we want to push those tomatoes out as quickly as we can because we're so eager for those tomatoes. I urge patience because I have found that the earlier you plant them, the, the worse they do because they, they have had so much pressure with cold temperatures and fluctuating temperatures and fluctuating rain um, and water events. So I actually don't plant mine until June 1st at the earliest. Um, I know everybody says you could do it on May 15th, but I think those of you who have grown out here know that it is still pretty cold on May 15th. Um, and I just, to be safe, wait till June 1st. Um, if anybody's ever had a tomato volunteer, so a tomato that decided to pop on, pop, pop up on its own, um, that's always my best tomato. It's the tomato that tastes the best, is the most prolific. And I last year noticed that I had a tomato that came up on July 4th and I was harvesting from that tomato in November prolifically. Um, doesn't always work, but it's just something to think about in terms of how warm is it when that tomato finally decided to emerge from the soil. Um, then we do fall crops. So your greens and your root veg, sometimes starting around July 15th. So if you want carrots that you may harvest for Thanksgiving, you're gonna to wanna to pop those in around July 15th. Um, you have usually until mid-August to do that. Um, but double check on, you know, what the, the uh, seed packet says. Um, and then of course, my favorite thing to grow is garlic. So don't forget the garlic. If you have not grown garlic already, I urge you to do so even just a couple of bulbs um, that you would pop in the ground around October 15th um, or up until I planted them late into December. Even Some people would say, don't do that, but I do. It's been fine. <laughs> Um, I can make these, uh, these slides will be available obviously with the recording, but I can also make any of these sheets available. But this is just a general guideline that we use at the Organic Gardener that sort of, again, breaks it up into cold loving crops, heat loving crops, your um, fall planting crops, and then your overwintered crops. And it just helps us figure out, you know, how to manage our uh, garden planning and planting. Um, the items that are um, in Yes, the items that are um, in italics here are obviously ones that you'd be better off getting as a plant. That starting from seed is a little bit more challenging. Um, I do want to touch a little bit on how to plant. Um, and I think the main thing to talk about here is direct seeding versus transplanting. And this is where you gain into the ground and getting some work done and the exciting part of gardening really starts to happen, especially as we're still navigating colder temperatures. Um, so that's putting a seed in the ground versus raising your own or buying that plant. Um, you know, for soil, for direct seeding, you really do have to wait until it is warmer um, and the soil temps and at least the soil itself has thawed. Um, with transplanting, obviously these are things that you're going to start inside under optimal conditions um, or as optimal as we can get them. And um, planting them outside when they're ready. So I do wanna talk a little bit about those items. So this here shows um, a number of items that um, we've had success with seeding versus putting out as a plant. You can see that there are things that are the same. There are duplicates, for example, cucumber. We've had success seeding cucumber, especially later in the season. We've also had success planting cucumber as a seedling start that we started in our greenhouse. Um, worth experimenting with this. Um, the thing to remember is that for the most part, your heat loving crops are not going to love being planted or they're not going to necessarily give you a good yield if you plant them too early. Um, so for example, a pepper, a pepper seed, obviously, those of you who have grown peppers, you can't just put a pepper seed outside. Um, you have to start them inside because we just don't have enough of a growing season long enough to really get those guys to um, develop fruit for us. Um, but there are some obvious uh, exceptions to this, things like cucumbers that love it warm, but you can definitely still pop a seed in. So this is a, I think this is a useful um, sheet for you to take a look at and um, 
plan. So I'm sure that some of you are excited about doing your own seed starting. I encourage you to at least try it. Um, again, it's like any part of gardening. There's probably gonna be some failures. There's gonna be some things that didn't work out the way you wanted, um, but you have the ability to have so much more variety at your fingertips. You have an intimacy with your plants. I think it makes you a better gardener. You learn a lot about the needs of those plants by starting them on your own. Um, if you've never started seeds before, you're gonna have to invest in some equipment. And that doesn't mean that you're necessarily gonna be, you know, saving all your money on your groceries this year, growing your own food, but you, you, it's an investment and these things last a long time. I've got grow lights that I've been using for over 10 years. Um, so, and there's, you don't necessarily have to get all the equipment right away. You can start building your collection. You'll see, you'll get addicted. So, um, so just things you wanna consider for your seed starting supplies. I think lights are very important. I think it is something to invest in. Even sometimes for, uh, so many people love their house plants now too. Um, any decent grow light can help you with um, your house plants as well. Um, but you do need lights. I have not had success. And I think people feel like they haven't, they don't know what they're doing or they have a brown thumb when it comes to seedlings because their seedlings died on them and they'll send me pictures. And oftentimes they were really trying to rely on a windowsill. And that's great for some things, but for most of our heat lovers or things that you really wanna grow robust, they need um, more direct light and more powerful light than you're gonna get from your windowsill. For some things, bottom heat is really important. So they sell heat, mat, heat mats. I've gotten away with a warm bathroom that has a uh, register underneath the vanity. So it's really warm. Um, so be aware, I know people put it on top of their fridge where it's nice and warm, just to get some seeds need a lot of heat to germinate like peppers. Um, you're gonna have to get your hands on some pots and trays, cell packs. Um, those are things that, I mean, we always have a lot of, but you'd be surprised what things you can find. And that's a fun little jaunt on the internet to see what things you can use as different pots and trays. That being said, I've reused a lot of my plastic trays and pots for years and years and years. And when they start getting a little, you know, worse for the wear, I'll throw them out or recycle them if I can, it can be difficult to recycle. Um, but I try to reuse them as much as I possibly can. Um, one area that I am very poor at is labeling. Um, and I urge you to do better than me. Labeling is really important because I know you, you think you're gonna remember what you planted in that little six pack, but inevitably you forget. And then it's a fun adventure. It is to see what's gonna emerge from that, but it's best to label. Um, growing media, when it comes to seedlings, I do like to start with something that is specifically for seed starting. I've tried to make my own mixes and I haven't had as much luck. I sometimes get issues with what they call dampening off, which is a, a fungal issue. Um, so, you know, a little can go a long way. Um, I've also reused my growing media. Um, you can sometimes generate some issues with pest and disease pressure, but um, I don't necessarily, I want to use things as much as I possibly can to reduce the amount of plastic I'm using and how much money I'm spending. So um, just be aware of that. Um, Follow the seed packets or the catalog information. Those things are really for your disposal. I used to ignore these things, but as you can see here, it has some really valuable information. I love the ones that are just pictures because I can see, okay, this is a full sun plant, half an inch deep, 12 inches apart, how many days until I'm harvesting. It's very easy to follow that, um, especially if you're working with kids or maybe you're working with people who, you know, English isn't their first language. This is a way people can, can interact and connect. Um, some things to think about when you're doing your seed starting, you know, you want to pay attention to what is the temperature and the light after the seed has emerged. I think that's something else, you know, sometimes we, we put them in a, in a basement and it's a little too cold or maybe it's too musty and damp. Um, they want to be warm. Um, I often bottom water my seedlings so that they don't get too waterlogged. Um, and I will get a fan going. Um, the fan actually really helps it, not just to get some air circulation, but helps the plant itself get used to being outside um, because it's not gonna be away from wind when it's outside. Um, that's why I say play with your seedlings. I run my hands across them. Um, I talk to them, <laughs> I move them around. Um, I never let them sit too long in one place. 
Um, I want them to just feel a little bit of that, you know, we're going outside. You're not gonna stay in this neat little optimal condition forever. Um, and I think also not starting too early is really important. I start my tomatoes March 1st, I'm so excited. And then they would sit there and sit there in their pots for too long. They get very root bound. And I realized that they would do just as well. The example I gave of the volunteer tomato, if they just, if I started them later and got them into the ground, even if they're a little bit smaller, um, you want nice, you know, thick stems. You don't want super leggy as we've seen things that have been trying to reach towards the light. Um, it's called internode space. I like there to be some, some space or some, some a limited amount of space in between the, the leaves. Um, and if, if you did start them early or we've got a cold snap, just be aware of how much room are they, do they have in their pot right now. They might need to get um, pot up into a bigger pot. Um, and then I'm sure a lot of you have heard this, but don't just put them outside. I have lost a few items in the past, um, even as early as last year, I lost my, um, my sweet peas. I was so excited to finally grow sweet peas. And then I put them outside and it was 90 degrees on the day I was working all day. <laughs> and I didn't water them and they died. And I was very bummed. So there you go, we all make mistakes and it, it happens. But starting small, getting out there and experimenting um, is totally worth doing. Um, I do want to, I do want to let you know a couple of resources um, that this, like, these are not people that we, we, we buy from these people, but you know, we're not selling for them, but um, these are places where we get our seeds. Um, seed Savers Exchange, Johnny Selected Seeds, and Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds. Um, just be aware that there's a lot of demand right now. There's also just generally delays because their warehouses are not as staffed as they usually are. And I know for some of these items, um, or some of these places like Johnny's, they weren't even allowing home growers to order until last week. Um, we ordered in December because we're commercial growers, um, but it's actually a big issue. In that regard, I would highly suggest going to your local um, co-op, um, your local uh, garden center. There's so many seeds available. Um, you don't necessarily just have to get them online. I know it's fun to get them online, but there's a lot of delays. That being said, I do want to just give a, a quick shout out to a few resources that um, we use a lot, and that's Gethsemane Garden Center. Love them. They're not too far from Willamette. They have a really great organic selection. Um, a new place that opens, City Grange, highly recommend the work that they're doing. We also love Mikey Garden Center in Niles. Um, but don't, if you're looking for plants, especially, and you're, you haven't had the chance or the wherewithal, to start your own seeds or maybe you want to supplement what you've done. Uh, your local, farmer, local farmer's markets, so many of the growers now are supplementing what they're doing with plants. Um, and if you're looking for compost, we get our compost from Reds in Northbrook. I highly suggest you check out some of the things in the city as well, like healthy soil compost um, that will have compost available for you to purchase into your garden. Again, it could be you should buy a couple bags. You don't you don't have to bring in a truck. Depends on how much you're actually gardening. Um, and then I just do a, a big shout out here to these three books that have sort of helped me a lot in my learning of how to interact with plants. Um, one, this one in the middle here, the Rodales Illustrated Encyclopedia of Organic Gardening. It's a beautiful book. Anything from Rodales, I'm sure many of you have read some of their um, great offerings. Um, really great info about organic gardening organized in really helpful ways. Teaming with microbes, one of my favorites that helps you understand more about how um, the soil microorganisms work and how that whole ecosystem operates and, the more, and what we're learning about it. And then I do just wanna give a recommendation for braiding sweet grass. I'm sure many of you have read it and it's not specifically about gardening, but it really helped me understand a little bit more about um, how to interact with the natural world and what sort of uh, gratitude I should bring to my gardening so that I actually get a bigger uh, yield and better um, produce. I have felt that it's also a mental exchange that I'm doing with those plants. And I really think that um, this book helps um, explore that in like a not too frou-frou way. So 
Um, yeah, so I just wanted to show a few pictures of some of the work that we've done just so you can see um, a little bit about how we use texture and how we use um, different plants. Um, so you can see here in this garden, we've just got, we've got a lot going on. So I know I said all that about giving your plants a lot of room to grow, but we're also trying to think of things that are gonna be in and out. So in this picture, you see there's some onions. On this day, we actually harvested those onions so that we could allow the things behind it to grow a little bit bigger. Um, and I'll just go through a couple of these just because it's fun to get some inspiration, I think. Um, don't be afraid to grow up, um, you know, using trellises. Um, you can build a lot of these things on your own. Again, uh, looking on the internet for some of these things, it's just so fun um, to see how other people have decided to grow their plants. Um, and you see, this is a very tall raised bed. This is one way in which we simultaneously dealt with rabbits, but also um, it's a more accessible bed. We can actually don't have to lean down and kneel. We can stand and work with the plants. So um, different materials that we've used. I mean, you can see this is a really cool metal, um, corrugated metal that actually is very warm and works great for growing. You can see here, there's a little um, mason bee um, house. Again, we like to try and use as much vertical space as we can. Think about growing your cucumbers up. I've even grown like butternut squash up a cage, um, something where they can, you can get more room for actually growing other crops and also get some airflow going. This, you can see this here, this picture is a garden that we um, did this year on a um, residential building in the city in Boys Town. And it was a riot of just growth and it was planted on July 17th. So it just depends on the microclimate you have. It's very warm up there. You see there are rocks and gravel and some corrugated metal. Um, it was also a place where uh, the residents of the building stopped every day and interacted with the garden, even just looking at it or picking a few flowers. And I wholeheartedly believe that that led to a very successful garden. Um, and this was after a frost. So the same garden after a frost, you can see those tomatoes, they look pretty sad. They, they came down this day, um, but we still had a lot going on in the garden. Kale, cucumbers, surprisingly did not get as hit with frost as we thought they were gonna get. Um, but I just, you know, I love, the, I love the, the garden in all its glory, even when it's a little messy and things are on its way out, so. And then, um, yeah, just one of my favorite gardens, really cool looking triangular garden. As you can see here, I actually put okra with peppers and the okra here got to about eight feet tall and it actually helped shade the peppers a little bit and um, helped reduce some of the sun scald that we occasionally see on pepper plants. So that, is the end of my presentation. I know we're gonna have some Q&A. Um, I did just wanna say that if anybody has any questions um, and follow up to this, you feel free to email me. Um, it's just adrian at theorganicgardener.net and I can put that in the chat. Um, but yeah, ready for questions. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adrian. That was awesome. We really, really enjoyed those beautiful pictures at the end. We loved your examples. We loved the tips that you gave. It was perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I love helping people grow. So um, anything I can do to help. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it is, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to be able to share. So we appreciate it. Um, we are going to get to some questions. We want to remind everybody, um, go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, the chat feature, we're going to save for resources that people want to share with each other and that Adrian can plug in some um, of her resources as well. But the Q&A is really what we want to focus on for the moment. Um, uh, you can also, uh, you might be able to do something called an upvote. Uh, it might be an option there. So if you see a question that you like, you can click upvote. Um, if it's not there, don't worry about it. But um, Q&A is where we want to go now. So um, we also want to remind people that we have um, a webinar on soil health on March 10th. 
So coming up, yeah. So right, <laughs> so more about soil. It's it's not just dirt. <laughs> um, March 10th, so you can go to our you know pages for that. Um, so Adrian, thank you so much. Um, we had we have uh, yeah plenty of questions for you. Um, yeah, I could. I mean, I could start answering some of these. Um, okay, that's fine. Let's see. Um, I will start from the top. Is it okay to use rain barrel collected water to water vegetables? I am concerned the runoff from the roof could be somehow contaminated and shouldn't be used on edibles. Um, yes, I, you know, when you, if you're growing food for production, this is certainly a concern. If you're using collected water, it's actually not safe to use it on items that are gonna be eaten and harvested within, um, I think about 48 hours. Um, so I just, you know, especially if you're not gonna, if it's not a leafy vegetable, um, if it's not something you're gonna eat raw, I think it's fine. Um, just if it's something you're not gonna cook, I would be wary just allowing some time to, to lapse between when you use that rain barrel collected water to water your vegetable and when you're actually eating the vegetable. Um, the question about growing and growing in containers, when do you plan to cover crop like hairy vetch? So something like hairy vetch actually, I mean, can get a little wild. So just be aware of that. Um, it depends, you can actually plant hairy vetch almost any time of the year. Um, I tend to like to do it um, about end of August, early September, and I might actually just put it around anything that I'm already growing in there. I know containers can get a little tight, um, but you can grow just a few seeds and it'll actually get uh, viney. And then once you're done growing your food in that container, you can um, kind of just smash that down on top of the, the soil of the container. Um, the best soil testing I recommend, um, <laughs> there's a few different sources. Um, if you, there's two different kinds of soil tests. There are, um, your contaminant testing and then there's your nutrient testing. And so for contaminants, there's, um, of course, I am totally blanking on the name, but we can get you that name, but there's a couple different places you can get. There's one, um, through UIC actually that we used, um, stat analysis, S-T-A-T, -T, stat analysis. They have a really quick turnaround. And they test for heavy metals if you're concerned about that. Um, and then we send out um, our nutrient testing to the University of Massachusetts um, and Logan Labs in Ohio. I can also get those to everybody. Um, but honestly, when it comes to soil testing, it's just a picture. It's just a, it's a snapshot. Um, and it's really just how you interpret it. So I think any testing service is really okay if you're gonna do some research and see what does it really mean for your soil. Um, I like soil tests, but I definitely don't wanna discourage people from not gardening if they don't have a nutrient test. It's really just a snapshot of, of um, what you're working with. Um, is it okay, okay or beneficial to leave the end of season spent veggies on the soil as a mulch for the winter, like pulled up kale plants, et cetera? Okay, I love doing this. I cut, I chop up everything <laughs> and I put it on the soil. I am sure that I am good. There may be controversy about this. There's definitely some concern of pest uh, res or residue from uh, funguses or bacteria or um, the eggs of uh, pests. Um, so there are a couple crops I tend not to do this with, and that's anything that's in the what they call cucurbit family. So that's your watermelon, your cucumbers, uh, your pumpkins. Um, mostly because it's a little bit messy and there, there are a lot of cucumber beetle issues. And I did see there was a question about that. Um, so I really love doing that um, because those nutrients were pulled out of the ground and now they're done. So um, putting them, chopping them up and putting them back in the soil is great. I tend to not pull plants up out of the ground as much. I want to leave those roots in the ground. There's actually still microbes living on the soil or on the, um, the roots. So if I can just cut it down as low as I can, a nice set of loppers, a good investment, and then chop them up even more, then I'll just cover that area with the debris from my plants. There are people who do it the complete opposite and say everything needs to come out and you need to start cleaning every year. Again, you have to experiment, see what works for you. Um, question about cover crops, do you do in the fall? There are definitely cover crops that you do in the fall and that you leave to what they call over winter and die back into the soil. Um, but you don't necessarily only have to do it in the fall. 
you can do it earlier in the year and you can grow around and in and amongst your cover crops. Just be careful what you pick. There are some cover crops like ryegrass that have very deep roots and will compete with your vegetables. But there are other things like peri vetch that I love, um, or like I said, other vegetables like radishes and turnips that won't take up as much um, of the root space. So um, do some research on that, do a little reading about um, cover crops. It's a really cool way to keep your soil alive. Adrian, can we ask a question about yes. um, backyard composting um, yeah. to improve the soil health? How can we weave that? How can we weave that in? I mean, it's just as just as good or? Yeah, for sure. I mean, your compost in your backyard is going to be made up mostly of the things that were in your yard, right? And then your um, your plant or your, your, your scraps from your kitchen. I've been doing my own compost um, for as long as I lived in this house, which is about uh, 12 years or so. And over the years I've developed, you know, I've built a lot of compost and I am putting a lot of that just right on the, on the garden. That being said, your backyard composter, depending on the system that you have, is not necessarily gonna be hot enough to kill off weed seeds. So be careful putting weed seeds in there. Um, and it certainly will not be hot enough to kill off things like tomato seeds. So sometimes you're gonna be going through and you're, you're, you're adding things that may germinate, but I'm willing to deal with that to have the ability to use my own compost. Mm -hmm. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll give it a week or two. I might put the compost down and see what emerges, then take those out. Um, but actually what I've now switched to is just using my compost a lot harvesting it in the fall and really covering everything up over the winter with that compost and just let it kind of trickle in, especially with this great fall, you know, snowfall we had. That's actually really wonderful to get that into the soil. Wonderful, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, how much time do we have left? Um, we've got about, let's do like 10 to 15 minutes. Okay, great. Make sure we get some of these questions. Um, a question here about cucumber and squash bug. Um, this has been a really, really big issue. Um, I haven't, we have not figured out a great way to deal with um, cucumber, beetles, and squash bugs, which are sometimes said interchangeably, but they're two different things. Um, I have found that some row cover, like I mentioned, can help with some of the um, squash beetle. Um, but I, we have yet to find something that is really good. I know that's not a really awesome answer because I know people want an answer for that one, but what we've been actually pivoting to is trying to prevent the beetles and squash bugs from getting on the plants in the first place by trying to get those plants to be as healthy as we possibly can. And this may be discussed a bit in the soil section, um, but we are using a lot of um, actively aerated compost tea. So this is tea that we bubble. We actually add oxygen to it, um, compost and water basically with some food for the microbes. And we've had some success with making plants that are just so healthy that they are physically indigestible to those cucumber beetles and the squash. And so they don't even bother with the plant. It doesn't always work and it's a process. <laughs> like I said, I've been growing for a long time and I have a company behind me that's willing to invest in the compost tea, um, but it, it's a tricky one. Um, and it's not something we've had a lot of luck with getting rid of and I think they're getting worse. Um, I had a question about uh, what best way to amend the soil in a perennial flower bed. Um, I think a lot of times people are concerned about their perennial areas. They don't want to dig up. They don't want to disturb the plants that they already have in there. So I think the best thing for amending soil in any place where you don't want to disturb the soil too much is mulch, mulch, mulch. So you can add a little compost as what we call top dressing, and you can mulch on top of that. And you can use whatever mulch you want to use in your space. Um, it can be, you know, for your perennials, oftentimes a hardwood mulch is totally fine. Um, and it's actually beneficial, um, you know, to whatever you kind of, if you want to do a lot of ground up leaves, that's my favorite thing because they're free. And um, even just a, uh, the mower attachment, or if you have landscapers that may be doing that for you, um, asking them to break up some of the leaves and leave it in a pile for you. Mm -hmm. um, leaves are amazing. <laughs> um, uh, any recommendations on finding wood timber that has not been treated? Um, so we only use cedar 
timbers in all of our gardens, unless we're using another product, like there's some metal um, and, and stone that we've used. Um, you, we get all of our stuff from standard lumber. Um, things are getting very, very expensive with mm -hmm. cedar. It is astronomically more expensive every month. Um, so just be aware of that. And I don't, I, I think there's a number of issues that are causing that, but I think that's something that we're going to be facing for a while. Um, costs of everything have gone up and certainly cedar is not getting here um, as quickly as it used to. And so it's just pricey. I know trucking has been an issue for it too. And then uh, the same person asked, um, and for the raised beds, does it all need to be soil? Can it be filled with other materials, rocks in the bottom? Absolutely. You know, I try to aim for 12 inches of soil depth um, in a raised bed, or even if I'm just trying to raise up the soil line of my soil um, or my garden space, um, but you can use rocks. I've had some success growing containers where I just throw in a bunch of um, twigs, uh, leaves, um, pottery shards, you know, anything you've got that I know you wanna pay, take up some of that volume so you don't necessarily have to spend so much money on that potting soil, but also just to make it lighter. Um, so yes, absolutely. Um, I like to, and one of my favorites is We've done that with some gardens too, where we had really tall raised beds where it just was too expensive to go all compost. So we went with rocks. Um, okay, so I have a question here about rotating crops. I know we were supposed to rotate crops, but I have only one raised bed, so what do you recommend? We don't rotate our crops. Um, we are in the same position that you are in. A lot of our gardens are pretty small. You know, we're, we're in people's backyards or we're in a school garden where there's one raised bed. Um, it's certainly on a large scale for farmers. It can really help with certain pests and disease, um, but I'm not a believer of it necessarily when it comes to your backyard garden. If you've got a spot that tomatoes have done well in the last five years, why mess with it? if it's doing well for you. Now, if there's some reason why you think maybe switching it up would, as an experiment, let's see if it does better, certainly go ahead. Um, but if you've got a you know, place that where those things work, keep going with it. I've got a few gardens that I do that it's the same plan every year. We know it works, it, that we know how it's gonna look, the client's really happy with how it looks, and I'm not as concerned about the rotation. Um, somebody asked about, keeping squirrels out? Is there any specific fencing that keeps squirrels out? I wish the answer were anything good, but no, not that I'm aware of. <laughs> um, in general, are there any veggies that do better in less sun? Yes, your greens, um, spinach, lettuces, some of the herbs like cilantro, dill. Um, I tend to think of things that are cool weather crops can do well with less sun. Um, I think you can get away with six hours, you know, eight, six to eight hours. Um, you might, you're still able to grow, even if you have four hours. It's just things are going to get a little leggier and they might, they might look a little more, um, pick that because they will get more pest pressure. So just keep that in mind, but you can certainly try it and you, you never know. Things sometimes do really well and you would have no reason to believe that they should. But again, you like love that plant. <laughs> and you spent time with it and I feel like that can sometimes turn things around. Um, let's see. Yes, some more questions about rotation. So I yes, like I said, we don't rotate. Um, ah, so question about protecting your zucchini plants um, to keep out the squine, ugh, squine, squash vine borer. Um, we used to do the tinfoil method I see that's what um, somebody asked. Um, and I did not, I don't know. I mean, the answer is, I don't know if it was that helpful. Um, and then I had like tinfoil in the garden. It's, it seemed kind of weird. Um, one thing that we've had some success with is again, covering those zucchinis, um, but making sure that you open them up in the morning so that they can get pollinated. Um, and then we've also had squash vine borers that did some damage, but the plant kept producing. So we just, we got in there, took that gross larva out and covered that uh, wound up with um, soil. 
and the zucchini actually develop more roots just around that area. So, nice. Um, yeah, I think, uh, let's see here. Oh, um, growing early spring, four to six weeks before last frost. How does one know when the last frost is? Um, that is based on your USDA zone. And like I said, most of us close to the lake will be zone 5B, which our general last frost date on average is May 15th. But it, that's an average, so it can go all the way to May 25th. Um, a lot of times, even on the news, like I know Tom Skilling, my favorite, he'll mention um, that the, the, the average last frost date um, in mid-May. You know, mid so you might even just catch it on uh, a news program. But you can look it up online, um, look at your zone, and it'll tell you even more narrowed into like your zip code. Sometimes it can tell you a little bit more about that, but around May 15th. Um, should we do one more question? And, one or, more, okay, let's see. We could, we could do maybe how important is it to use organic See, I mean, this is all about organic, right? So yes. how, you know, if, I, if I'm at the store and I'm like, I really wanna buy that cucumber seedling, but it's not organic, should I just, you know, I mean, however, cucumbers have, for, for me, very high su success rate with seeds alone, but. yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, and same here. We've got real great success with with seeds alone. Actually, sometimes I think better. Mm -hmm. You know, we struggle with that too because we try and try our best to get as many organic seeds that we start as we can, but it's not always possible to get it. You know, um, that certification is challenging to get. When it comes to, but I've also like rescued like trees from like Home Depot. Like, I feel like mm -hmm. it's more important what I'm going to do with it when I bring it home. Mm -hmm. um, I think for sure it's important um, and I'm always trying to buy organic, but don't let it stop you. That's the, the only cucumber plant you can get your hands on. Cause it, at least last year, it seemed like things were selling out really quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Not to panic anybody, but people really want to go out there and grow. So yeah. On yeah. that note, we, um, I actually did a, a seed sharing, you know, you end up using a, maybe only half of your packet. So just, uh, trade with some neighbors and you're all good. You got a whole garden. <laughs> yes. Thank you for mentioning that. Cause I meant to mention that actually, when I was talking about the seeds, like I have so many seeds, you know, um, so all of us, we get so excited and you end up buying way more than you need. So getting together and making that connection with somebody else, you, you really might, um, be able to get your hands on something fun if you've got a community of people who are growing. So, and if they're stored, if they're stored well, they could be used the next year. Right. Yeah, See, for the most part, yeah. Um, things gonna get moldy. So yeah, I mm -hmm. tend to keep it in um, a cool, dark place. Um, I also just double check the date and see when was the last. Like, when did I actually buy that? Because I'd be, I'm surprised sometimes how old some of my seeds are. For the most part, most seeds are totally fine. Um, there are some exceptions. I know onion seeds are notorious for not germinating very well after the first year. Mm -hmm. But one thing you can do, and this is fun also to do with kids, but I don't have any kids and I do this anyway. Germination tests. Take 10 seeds from your packet. If you have 10 seeds to spare, put them on a paper towel, miss that paper towel, put that paper towel in a plastic baggie, wait a couple days and see how many seeds germinate. And you can get a rough sample of what your germination rate is. So if only half of them came or germinated, that's fine. That just, you're going to have to put more seed in. <laughs> yeah. If you're doing something like radishes, maybe like just throw in more seed. You can always thin later. Mm -hmm. so. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. That's yeah. so fun. Um, all right, folks. So we're, we actually, for those that want to stay longer, we have one more poll question and Beth is going to jump in and chat about community gardens and yard sharing. So if you'd like to hang out where, you know, we will end at eight 30. So about 12 more minutes, but let's, let's do a quick poll question, um, right now. And then, uh, Beth is going to jump in. So are you inspired to grow more food after, um, uh, since before this, uh, webinar began, does it kind of get you a little revved up? Some people are commenting on, uh, you know, getting kind of out of the winter blues, kind of <laughs> seeing those wonderful veggie garden pictures. Our mouths are watering for like real food again. Yes. <laughs> um, Okay, wonderful. All right. So 15, 15 say I plan to grow, you know, food for the first time. That's wonderful. 40% are saying I plan to continue growing food 
as I have in the past. And 42% are saying I plan to grow more or additional kinds of food. So that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, also, uh, folks in our chat, we've added a couple more um, places where you can find seedlings and seeds um, like the Talking Farm, Chalet, West End Gardens, Just Sethamain, and Lurvies. So all of those are also um, in addition to the ones that Adrian mentioned at the end of her her um, slideshow. Um, but all Adrian, of those are great. <laughs> yeah, and then um, there's also some wonderful resources on the Organic Gardener. You guys have videos and of course this the book and um, so there are resources there on your website too, right, Adrian? Yep. yep. Okay, wonderful. Um, great. Thank you. So thank you so, so much for your time, Adrian. We appreciate it. Um, you've, you've also given your email address, which is wonderful. Um, we hope everyone has learned something today and feel inspired. Um, Beth is going to jump in and mention community gardens. Beth is the president of Go Green Will Met. Um, she's been with Go Green. We, Go Green Will Met has been around for over 15 years. And um, welcome, uh, Beth. Thank you for joining us again. Hi, thank you. Um, thanks. It's so uh, it's great to get excited about growing food again. Um, wanted to let everyone know that there is a huge movement um, growing. It's called, you've heard about the Victory Gardens during World War II. They're now calling these climate victory gardens. Um, this is actually a really good way for each and every one of us to contribute to um, reducing climate change. Because if your food is coming from your backyard, you're not driving to get it. It's not getting shipped across the country. It's not being packaged in plastic bags. So um, it's, a, it, it's a really significant way to contribute to um, a, better, a better climate for all of us. Um, one thing that Adrian really stressed is that sunshine is probably the most important um, ingredient in a successful veggie garden. And a lot of us are blessed with beautiful, huge trees that shade our yard. So there is two options, um, community garden plots, people think about, a lot of people already know that Wilmette has a, an enormously long waiting list for community garden plots. These are run by the park district. And I just talked to the executive director, Steve Wilson, and they absolutely are committed to make more garden plots available for the summer of 2022. So that's not gonna be an option for this summer, but do know that the park district has it very much on their radar screens to increase the, the availability for garden plots. Also wanted to suggest to some of you that if you have a shady yard and you really wanna grow food, see if you can't reach out to a neighbor with more sun or a friend who has a sunny yard and see whether they would partner with you, allow you to put in some garden, some veggies in their backyard. They can help you with the work. You'd, you could share the, um, share the uh, produce with them. So yard sharing is, is definitely an option that could work right away. Um, and so with, with that, if um, Amy, I think I'll thank you, Amy, for organizing this webinar, The Organic Gardener, who we love. And um, you will be able to see this webinar again or share it with someone you know. It will be on our YouTube channel within about 48 hours. And keep know that we're going to be doing these webinars all year long, and we hope that you will come back and join us to learn and grow and be part of the growing green movement on the North Shore. So thank you very, very much for that. And we'll conclude. Thank you.